talking about uh, my recent book. Basically, the, the content of my recent book, uh, Jesus, uh, Islam's Jesus, uh, or you can say Jesus in Islam. Um, my uh, plan is to speak for 45 minutes and then uh, have your questions. We will have a good time for questions. All questions are welcome. So when we say um, uh, Islam's Jesus, who was Jesus first? Who was Jesus according to the Islamic tradition? Basically, uh, as Dr. Wayne said, uh, this is Islamic perspective. Islamic perspective. We will find, you will find some interesting things. Uh, of course, the details on it is in my book. So, uh, the, you know, I don't like to promote too much, but I have to promote a little bit. Uh, it, uh, it is on Amazon, it's available on Amazon now. The, uh, the hardcover uh, is a little bit expensive, but I am glad that they are publishing now the paperback, which is considerably inexpensive. Uh, so this will be, uh, as famous Muslim poet uh, Rumi says uh, in regard to his Masnavi, uh, will be the summary of the summary of the summary of my book. So <laughs> we will be considerably brief about the, the content of the book. First of all, uh, according to the Islamic tradition, Jesus was born from Virgin Mary. Uh, basically, uh, Islam is the, well, scholars are in agreement that Islam is the only religion that agrees with Christianity about the miraculous birth of Jesus. That Jesus was born miraculously. Uh, Mary was not touched by any human being. The, the birth of Jesus was a miracle. Islam agrees and there is a chapter in the Quran after Mary named after Mary um, in that chapter we have a detail of, of the, the birth of Jesus secondly uh, Jesus is bringer of peace uh, Islam gives an eschatological role to Jesus uh, he will bring peace uh, I will talk about this uh, how what is the meaning of it uh, how Jesus is a bringer of peace um, he is one of the five elite prophets in Islam. Uh, elite prophets. In Islam, um, Muslims believe that, based on the sayings of the prophet, uh, believe that uh, 124,000 prophets came before Islam. All of them were true people. All of them were uh, representing God on earth. Um, Maybe more, but the Prophet, in one of his sayings, says 124,000. Some Islamic scholars uh, interpret this as, uh, um, as indication of uh, multiplicity. Many Prophets, many Prophets. So maybe these are in Arabic. The term indicates uh, um, many personalities came as a Prophet. But among these, there are five uh, uh, as the greatest of these Prophets. Uh, five, uh, I call them five elite prophets. Uh, the, the Islamic term for it is Ulul Azm, which literally can be translated as the possessors of steadfastness. Um, these are five. Uh, these are the highest. And these are Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon them all. Um, basically, uh, when we say these are the highest, so for example, forget Aristotle, forget Plato, you know, these are like the highest in the philosophy uh, in, in human history, uh, forget all of them. These are the highest. These five people are the highest throughout human history. Um, and this is very significant. Very significant. Um, he is a Muslim. Uh, you might realize that I underline this. Uh, uh, it is with lowercase n. Uh, in Islam, Jesus is a Muslim. Uh, with lowercase n means uh, the one who submits himself to the will of God. 
So um, Jesus submitted himself to the will of God. That's why he was a Muslim. Um, Moses was a Muslim. Uh, Abraham was a Muslim. Anyone, literally, anyone who submits himself to the will of God is a Muslim with Lord case M. Uh, those who know Arabic, they, they, they know that in Arabic there is no lowercase, uppercase. And that's why it is encompassing. Uh, Muslim encompassing all. Uh, Pre-Islamic Muslims after Islam's Muslims. Um, we, in English, we distinguish uh, because uh, uppercase M uh, is for those who are following the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, in a certain period of time, which started in uh, 609 Common Era, uh, those are known as Muslims. Um, I was giving uh, this talk at the uh, uh, University of Alberta, and the gentleman raised his hand and he said, well, you know, he was a Muslim, he said, Oh, we like Jesus to be with, with uppercase M. <laughs> okay, I said, but a, there is a problem here. Sometimes you may be with uppercase M Muslim, but not with lowercase M Muslim. <laughs> and that is problematic. Because you may be named as a Muslim with uppercase M, but in reality, because you do, you do not submit yourself to the will of God, you are not Muslim with lowercase M. And that's why lowercase M is stronger, actually. So if you know I said it's stronger. Um, Jesus is a miracle worker. Uh, we see many miracles of Jesus in, um, in the Quran. Um, I will mention some of them uh, just, you know, in a moment. Uh, he is also an intercessor. Uh, in the afterlife, in the Islamic theology, there is there is a, a topic called intercession. Uh, in the afterlife, God gives permission to the prophets of God, like Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Moses, uh, Jacob, you know, all prophets of God that we have, we know their names in the Quran, uh, the right of, of intercession. So for example, if a person is, um, let's say, sinful, Jesus may ask God for the forgiveness of this person. Uh, sometimes I put this uh, in a, a contemporary term. Uh, I compare it to letters of recommendation. Uh, you know, when you write a letter of recommendation, you, su you suggest that this person to be hired, but it is up to the institution or the people who are in search committee to, to hire the person or not. So basically, uh, these uh, prophets of God ask God to uh, forgive the person, but it is God who forgives. God forgives or not. Uh, forgives or not, does not forgive. Um, generally, generally, we know from the sayings of the prophet that because these are the, the beloved of God, you know, Jesus is a beloved of God, Moses is a beloved of God, Muhammad is a beloved of God, God will not reject their request because they are so much beloved by God. Their request is absolutely accepted and that is so important. So, um, okay. Jesus in primary Islamic sources. Uh, now, you know the Quran, but some of you may not be familiar with the word Hadith. Uh, hadith is uh, a term used for the sayings of the Prophet. Prophet Muhammad said something and his companions um, uh, collected those sayings and then they called it Hadith. So it is different than the Quran uh, because the Quran is not the saying of the Prophet. The Quran is the saying of God, the word of God. But Hadith is the word of the Prophet. Uh, and we have many of these collected, uh, compiled by Islamic scholars. Um, it is considered the second important source of Islam. Uh, in, in these sources, we will see something about Jesus as well. Not only in the Quran, but also in the saints of the Prophet. So in the Quran, Jesus mentioned in more than 90 verses. 
it is so significant. Even a hint in the Quran is very important about anything. If there are 90 verses speaking of Jesus, that means this is very, very, very important for Muslims. It, because Quran is the, the major source of Islam, the, the, the Holy Book. Uh, characterized by his message, his personality is very important. Uh, the personality of Jesus, the person of Jesus is very important, but also his message. The Quran emphasizes his message, inviting people to the oneness of God, to, to believe in the creator of heavens and earth. So uh, this message is known in the Quran as um, Injil. Injil is a Quranic term um, used for the gospel. Um, the, when Muslims speak of this, they imagine exactly as they imagine the Holy Quran. It was the book of God, revelation from God to Jesus before Islam, but it was a true revelation of God. So that, their imagination is exactly similar to the Quran. Um, even in the medieval ages, uh, Muslim scholars um, debated whether Muslims are allowed to touch the gospel without having ritual cleansing, uh, as they do for the Quran. Uh, and generally the conclusion is that yes, you can touch, but because even its translation of the original message of God, uh, it is recommended that you have ablution. You have ritual cleansing before touching uh, the gospel. So that is what Muslims were looking for, uh, for uh, this, the Torah. It is true also for the Torah and for the gospel, for the Psalms as well. So in the Quran, um, surely I came to you with a sign from your Lord. I create from clay the likeness of a bird. Then I breathe into it and it becomes a bird by God's permission. This is one... Um, one verse about one miracle of Jesus. So he was able, uh, as the Quran states, he was able to uh, breathe into a bird made of clay and the bird would become a bird, a real bird and fly. It was a divine power given to Jesus. So God empowered him to do this. Uh, and that's why it's significant um, by God's permission. Jesus was doing this by God's permission. Why God would empower him to do this? Because God wanted to show that this person who is inviting people to the message of God is a righteous person and speaking on behalf of God. And that's why uh, God would empower his prophets. Similarly, God empowered Moses, God empowered Jesus, uh, and God empowered Abraham, Muhammad, uh, uh, with this type of miracles. Extraordinary things. Uh, not natural, uh, not following the nature of laws. Because in nature of laws, you cannot make a bird made of clay fly just breathing into it. But that was the breath of Jesus. That was a different one. Uh, similarly, in the, in the continuation of the verse, Jesus says, um, and also I heal the blind, the leper. These are miracles of Jesus. Uh, the person who lost his sight would come to Jesus. The Quran doesn't give the details, but it, it shows this as a miracle of Jesus, that a person, after the touching of Jesus, would receive his sight or their sight. It was again a miracle. And highly uh, mentioned, uh, different miracles of Jesus are mentioned in the Quran. Um, another uh, verse, uh, in this verse, Jesus confirms the Torah. Uh, Jesus says, uh, and I have come confirming that which was before me of the Torah, and to make lawful to you part of what was forbidden to you. And I have come to you with a proof from your Lord, so fear God and obey me. Um, that's also uh, 
confirmation of the Torah. Jesus did not reject the Torah, but confirmed the Torah according to the Quran. And it is absolutely Islamic because Muslims, in the same way, uh, believe in the Torah, believe in the Gospel, believe in the Quran, believe in the Psalms. In fact, when Muslims uh, teach their children, um, they say, we believe in all books of God. Among these, five are the greatest. The great books of God. Uh, sorry, four are the greatest. One, uh, the Torah was revealed to Moses. Psalms was revealed to David. Uh, Injil, the Gospel, was revealed to Jesus. And the Quran was revealed to Muhammad. We believe in all of this. It's a part of Islamic faith. In fact, it is one of the six articles of faith in Islam. Uh, six articles of faith to believe in God, to believe in God's angels, uh, to believe in God's uh, prophets, to believe in God's scriptures, which is this one, uh, to believe in the day of judgment, the resurrection, and to believe in the encompassing plan of God. So six articles of faith. One of these is to believe in the scriptures of God. And therefore, immediately believing in the gospel becomes part of Islamic faith. Believe in the Torah becomes part of the Islamic faith. And that is the message of Jesus. As in the continuation of the verse, Jesus says, and worship, God is my Lord and your Lord. Worship only Him. Worship only God. Uh, this is very important in Islam, to worship only God. Not any human being can be worshipped in Islam. Uh, you may like something, you may, you know, love somebody. Well, these are the prophets of God. They are the greatest. They are the beloved. But still, you are not allowed to worship them. For example, in Islam, if you worship Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, you are violating the major principle of Islam. That only worshiping God. And therefore, you are not, you are, uh, you do not worship Jesus, Islamically speaking. You do not worship Mary. You do not worship uh, angels. You worship only God. All these prophets of God are the greatest worshippers of God. They, they are guidance uh, how to worship God. They teach, they teach us how to worship God, but they are not to be worshipped. They are the leaders in, in worshipping God, but not to be worshipped. It's, it's, it's very significant in Islam. And that's why if, you know, our Muslims uh, in the, uh, among the, among our, our audience know that uh, there is, you know, in the first chapter uh, of the Quran, they recite in daily prayers, Iya kenabudu. Only we worship you, O oh God. In daily prayers, they repeat this. It's significant in Islam. And Jesus, in the Quran says this, and then it's, Jesus said, this is the straight path. This is the, the, right, the right way. Uh, another verse in the Quran, again, here we see the confirming the Torah and receiving a new message from, from God. Uh, again, in a different occasion, uh, the Quran uh, mentions that Jesus confirmed the Torah. Uh, it was very significant message of God as well. Uh, now, Jesus asks, this is at chapter 61, at the beginning I intended to ask you a question, especially Muslims in the audience, but I forgot to ask you, I will ask this question now. Uh, is there a chapter in the Quran named after Jesus? Muslims are expected to respond to this question. Generally, you say no. I hear that you say no, right? Um, well, if you look at the table of contents of the Quran, table of chapters, um, there is, you don't see this chapter. But actually, this chapter, chapter 61, has three names in the Quran. Has three names. Uh, one name is Asaf, which is the current one in the, you know, the Quranic, uh, uh, copies, uh, which means uh, the row of angels, as uh, The second name of this chapter 
is um, um, al Hawariyun, which means the disciples of Jesus. And the third chapter, uh, the, sorry, the third name is Isa, which means Jesus. So actually, it's chapter 61, uh, named after Jesus in the Quran. Well, we know that there's a chapter named after Mary, uh, but we don't know that there's a chapter named after Jesus. Uh, the Quranic chapters have different names. For example, another name, if I tell you, some Muslims, they will not know, I am sure. Uh, the first chapter of the Quran is called Fatiha, right? Is that right? Fatiha. Uh, but there's another name for it, it's called Ashafiya, which means healing. Many Muslims don't know about this. Anyway, let's go to our topic. Um, in this verse, uh, Jesus asks, who are my helpers in God's cause? And the disciples of Jesus would say, um, we are your helpers in, in God's cause. So uh, the Quran encourages Muslims to be like the disciples of Jesus. As as Jesus was frustrated and said, who will be my helpers? And the disciples said, we are your helpers. The Quran praises the disciples of Jesus. Now, I'm going to another topic, um, another aspect of uh, Jesus in Islam. And this is about the eschatological role of Jesus. The role of Jesus at the end of time which is in the Christian tradition known as the second coming of Jesus. Muslims do not say the second coming of Jesus. Uh, they say the descent of Jesus. The descent. Jesus is, I mentioned in the book actually, in a detailed way, uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus descent from heaven to earth to bring justice. Nuzul uh, Isa, that's the term used in the Islamic tradition. On this, I found uh, a huge literature. I, I would say more than 100 books in the Islamic tradition written on the descent of Jesus. And I had a chance to look, I think maybe 90% of them, um, as far as I could find. Um, and I categorized them into three categories. Uh, these um, are the categories. The first is the modernist approach. Now, this is generally a uh, philosopher's uh, approach, Muslim, uh, contemporary Muslim philosopher's approach. Some of them, I would say not all of them, but some of them, uh, reject the descent of Jesus totally. They say um, this is impossible. Someone who died 2,000 years ago cannot come back, period. No any, no any way for, his to come, for him to come. Um, the second approach is uh, the literalist approach. I call it the literalist approach. They say God is the most powerful. God can bring Jesus, and God will bring Jesus from heaven to earth. And I remember once I asked one of them, and I said, so you believe that uh, Jesus will come down, you know, like uh, in a, with a parachute, uh, um, CNN, ABC, all these televisions will be able to have an interview with him. Uh, he said yes, because that's God's power. God is most powerful. Uh, and God will bring him. Well, you know, all ideas, we respect the ideas, but uh, I didn't favor that idea. I favored the, the, this one, the interpretive approach. In my book, I elaborated further on that, and also I will talk a little bit more on this uh, interpretive approach. Um, interpretive approach, look at the subject uh, uh, from a, a symbolic language. Uh, suggests that the prophet used symbolic language. And that's why uh, you shouldn't expect a person coming from the sky. That's not the way God deals with humanity. Has no, has never sent a person coming from the sky. Um, and that's why God has, God has a way of dealing with human beings. Uh, we are living in the realm of cause and effect. If you, uh, if you uh, put um, a seed underground, let's say an apple seed underground, you have to wait for four years in order to get an apple from it. 
Well, if you say that uh, the Quran says, Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. God is powerful over everything. God can make an apple from this seed in 10 seconds. I believe in that, but it's, it is not the way that God deals with humanity. God can do that, but God doesn't do that. Uh, that's the way uh, interpretive approach suggests. Yes, God can do that. For God, nothing is, is impossible. Um, but God has a way of dealing with human beings. And this interpretive, interpretive approach is significant. And I, uh, I will elaborate a little bit more. Um, now, the percentage uh, of people who are following these ways in the Islamic tradition, uh, I would say the, the least one is the modernist approach. Uh, the, 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 the majority is the literalist approach. Unfortunately, um, the majority of Muslims believe in the literalist uh, approach. They, uh, and I asked uh, yesterday evening, there was two Muslims in my group, uh, he said, you know, I believe in the, in the middle one. And I said, why? He said, because it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's the reason. It's easier, you know, don't, don't use your mind too much. Just say God is powerful and that's it. You got it. Um, but this one is highly also accepted in the Muslim community, I would say, by, by scholars, uh, especially by scholars, the majority of scholars, I would say, uh, have this approach. And also, uh, regular people uh, would, uh, would accept this also. So some hints in the Quran about this role of Jesus, whether really it's mentioned in the Quran or not, uh, some scholars have found these verses as a reference to the descent of Jesus in Islam. Uh, this verse of the Quran, Jesus will speak to humanity from his cradle and in manhood, and he is of the righteous. Now, commentators of the Quran uh, say that um, Jesus uh, spoke from his cradle, that happened. The next one, will happen later after his coming, which is in manhood. Now the first one is it's very interesting. The Quran generally is concise, but with this regard is very uh, ha has many details about uh, Jesus speaking from his cradle. According to the story, um, and I asked one of my colleagues, Christian colleagues, if, there, if this story is in the uh, canonical Bibles, and he said, no, it's not uh, canonical Gospels. It's not in canonical Gospels. It, this is a miracle very unique to the Quran. Miracle of Jesus is only mentioned in the Quran. Uh, according to this um, uh, Quranic verses, uh, when Mary gave birth to Jesus, she brought Jesus to her community. And Mary was inspired by God that uh, uh, when they ask you a question, remain silent. Don't answer. So they accused Mary of committing adultery. They said, where did you get this baby? Uh, your, the Quran is very specific about it. They said, your father was not a bad person. Your mother was not a, an evil uh, person. How you have committed this uh, adultery and having this baby? And Mary just points at the baby, as if she says, don't ask me, ask the baby. Uh, the Quran doesn't speak about the age of Jesus at that time, but Muslim commentators generally say that Jesus was two days old and spoke. Uh, well, they said, how we can speak to someone who is incredible? And when they said this, Jesus started speaking. Uh, and we have the exact statements of Jesus uh, in the Quran. Uh, Jesus says, I am the servant of God. Peace be upon me when I was born. Peace be upon me when I, when I grew up. When I grow up, peace be upon me when I die. Uh, I will be the prophet of this community. Uh, and Jesus stops. Um, Commentators of the Quran uh, say that after this event, Jesus never spoke until the age of speaking. Oh, after one and a half years, um, two years. So that is the story uh, uh, that uh, related to 
the, um, uh, the, the uh, second speak of Jesus, which will be, they say, in manhood when he comes back, in the second coming, in the, uh, after the descent of Jesus. This is much more direct verse in the Quran. It says, uh, he's a sign for the hour. So have no doubt about it. And follow me, this is the straight path. Jesus is a sign for the hour. At the hour, as you know, the end of human history. Um, the Quran says Jesus is a sign for it. So Muslim commentators of the Quran uh, generally say that um, when Jesus descends, uh, when Jesus descent happens, that means the end of time is near. So when when will happen? Only God knows. But they say it is the end of time. It is. It indicates that. Some Islamic scholars have different interpretation. They say no. Uh, not Jesus' descent, but Jesus' Jesus' birth was the sign of the hour. That means the God who has created Jesus with no father, uh, with no physical father, uh, was uh, is able to resurrect human beings to create afterlife. Uh, so it is indicating the power of God. Have, they have different interpretation. Uh, in the hadith, in the sayings of the Prophet, now we have talked about the Quran. Uh, there are many other verses in the Quran, in the book I detailed, but here uh, I a little bit uh, shorten it. Um, in the hadith also we have many sayings of the Prophet. I think in, in the book I mentioned more than 100 sayings of the Prophet related to Jesus. Uh, this is very interesting. By God Almighty, the Prophet Muhammad says, by God Almighty, in whose hand my soul is. Jesus, the son of Mary, will soon descend among you Muslims as a just ruler. I underline that just ruler, uh, indication of justice. Jesus will bring justice to the, to the community of, of, of Islam. Um, the prophet says, and the prophet gives this as a good news for Muslims. The uh, prophet is happy with this that there is no hopelessness. Jesus eventually will come. He doesn't say, I will come. He says, Jesus will come. And that's why Muslims do not believe in the coming of the Prophet, in the descent of the Prophet. They believe in the descent of Jesus. Another saying of the Prophet, that is, oh, this is very interesting. Uh, this saying of the Prophet speaks of uh, one of the dreams of the Prophet. He saw Jesus in his dream. He says, uh, it has been shown to me while I was sleeping, in my dream, while I was circumambulating the Kaaba, I saw a man of brown color. Now, in Calgary, what's the color of Jesus? White, blonde, mostly. Um, well, the prophet says, Jesus was brown color. Uh, in his dream, he saw him. Uh, uh, someone who has brown color. And the best one can see among brown colored human beings. So imagine whatever you can imagine, the best person you can imagine as, you know, like in the beauty of brown color. Uh, the, the hadith continues, actually, the saying of the prophet continues, and the prophet says, he had long hair, uh, as if he was coming from uh, bad, as if water was dripping from his head. Again, indicating the cleanliness of Jesus. The prophet uh, indicates the cleanliness of Jesus. Uh, and then uh, the prophet says, I asked the people, who is this person? And they said, this is Jesus, the son of Mary. Uh, so the prophet gives uh, descriptions of Jesus, features of Jesus. And, and uh, uh, I, again, I asked one of my colleagues uh, while studying uh, for my book, do we have some references on the features of Jesus? He said, no, we don't have any references. And I think this way, it depends on the church. If you go to a, a church, you have a different color of Jesus. If you go to another church, you have a different one. Um, and that's perhaps the reason we don't have features of Jesus. Um, again, the prophet says, um, uh, on Jesus and the Islamic community, surely 
Jesus, the Messiah, will find some people from among my community as his helpers. Again, Jesus, the prophet is uh, giving this as a good news for Muslims. Um, Jesus will find some helpers uh, in my community. And the continuation of the, the hadith says, uh, those helpers of Jesus are better than, are like you or better than you. The narrator says, the prophet repeated this three times. Like you or better than you. Um, again, uh, the, third, the term that uses uh, in this uh, hadith, uh, the Messiah, Jesus is presented as Al-Masih. And the, in the Quran also, the title of Jesus is known as Al-Masih as well, as well, the Messiah. Uh, in Sufi literature, um, th there was a, something, uh, 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 the continuation of this hadith. Um, the, the Prophet says, uh, a community that I am the beginning and Jesus the end will never be disgraced. God will not disgrace a community that I am the beginning and Jesus the end of it. So the Prophet suggests that uh, he is the beginning of the community of Islam. Jesus is the end of the community of Islam. God will never disgrace the community of Islam because Jesus is coming at the end of it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Something on the uh, in the Sufi literature, Rumi um, speaks uh, of Jesus in his famous book called Al Matnaw. Uh, I found many interesting things. I put in the book actually, and some other mistakes. Uh, but here he uh, compares Jesus um, to um, um, the breath of Jesus uh, as an inner power, not like a physicality of it, but the inner power uh, of the breath of Jesus. Uh, and that's why uh, he says human beings are like that. Uh, not their physicality is the one that is uh, um, powerful, but the inner aspect of them is the most powerful. The inner, the spirit of human beings. He makes a comparison of that. A person is like the rod of Moses. A person is like the breath of Jesus, speaking of the uh, inner dimension of it. Uh, Jesus also is known as a prophet of love, and I like some Islamic scholars who really uh, took these statements uh, from this teaching. Uh, one of them is Bediu Zaman uh, Said Nursi. I put his name here, I think Said Nursi. Uh, and this statement is re-emphasized by Fethullah uh, Gulen, Mr. Gulen. I will have something on, on their uh, thoughts. Um, he says, to love love and to hate hatred. If you love love, love will increase. If you hate hatred, hatred will diminish. And actually he says, there is nothing deserves hatred more than hatred itself. So when you have this uh, thinking, I think hatred will diminish. Uh, he has a very beautiful statement. Again, he says, um, um, our heart is so full of love there is no space for hatred to enter it. When, when it's full, there's no space. Hatred is out. And that's why, I think that's very important teaching. And coming from this uh, idea of uh, prophetic love. Uh, now, some Islamic scholars, have, as I said, uh, have interpretive approach. What is their interpretive approach? What is the meaning? What, what do they understand from the descent of Jesus. Um, Muhammad Abdul is one of these pioneers, I would say. He is a modernist, but with this regard, he is not following the general modernist idea. Because he sees many sayings of the Prophet, and he says it is impossible to deny all of them. Just to say, you know, these are not um, um, reliable sources. Uh, he says there is some, there are some reliable sources. And that's why he interprets this. Uh, he says, the descent of Jesus and his ruling on earth can be interpreted as the dominance of his spirit and his enigmatic message to people. 
This is what dominates Jesus' teachings of commanding mercy, love, and peace. Basically, to have this mercy, love, and peace, that is the meaning of the descent of Jesus, he says. That's what uh, Muhammad Abu said. And further, he, uh, he has a long, um, uh, actually, um, ideas um, on, on the subject. Um, uh, he um, also says that in the time of Jesus, in the time of the descent of Jesus, uh, people will be much more concerned about spirituality. People will, will take uh, the spirit of law to heart, not the appearance of it, not the literalism of it. Um, they will not stick to the appearance of the law, to the, uh, to the outer of the law, rather to the spirit of the law. And I think this is very significant. Many problems that we have today in the Islamic world is because of the literalism. Uh, sticking to this, to the to the outer of the law, and uh, ignoring the essence of it, the uh, the the major uh, element of it, which is the spirit of it. For example, uh, just Islamically speaking, theologically speaking, if you pray for fifty years, five zero, fifty years, five times a day. But you pray for Shov, let's say, that prayer is meaningless. Because there is no sincerity. That is the spirit. That's why in Islam, the spirit of it is, is important. The spirit of law is important. And I think these extremist groups, terrorist groups, uh, when they refer to some Islamic sources, they have no clue about the spirit of those sources. Instead, they stick to the to the literal, and sometimes they take the verse out of its context, and it becomes totally misleading. And unfortunately, this is a problem in the Islamic world. Um, Muhammad Hamdi Yazar, also is an Islamic scholar, um, he says the word of Jesus did not have any other meaning than the word of Tawheed, the oneness of God. He understands the word of Jesus as Tawheed, the oneness of God. Uh, the real spirit of the Torah and the Gospel is solely this Tawhid. Well, that's you know, what we know in the uh, history of religions that Islam, Christianity, Judaism are monotheistic religions. The essence of it is Tawhid, the oneness of God. Um, I uh, translated a section from Hamdi Yazar's book, which is not available in English, uh, it's in Turkish, and I put as an appendix uh, in the book. So there is uh, a big section on, on this, actually, on these ideas. And that's why I will skip this one. I will go to, um, to the next one. Uh, the interpretive approach uh, by the New Zealand Sayyidus. I found this the most important one. Because Nursi uh, speaks of dialogue. When? In 1911. Much, much early years, in 1911. He, he gives a talk, uh, a khutbah, actually, khutbah means term, uh, at the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, modern-day Syria, uh, at the presence of 10,000 people. And in this khutbah, 1911, he says that the future of humanity is in cooperation between Christians and Muslims. And he, he elaborated on this. And he interpreted Jesus, the descent of Jesus, uh, as the, uh, the, this cooperation, as this cooperation and dialogue uh, between Christians and Muslims. Well, he has a point, and I found this, uh, this as important, because, uh, and then I call it Abrahamic religions, Abrahamic traditions. Uh, you know, if just the family of Abraham, this family, you know, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, if they come together, they constitute 58% of humanity. More than half of humanity. They can be in peace. 
they can contribute to peace. And I think that's very, very significant. And that's why he says, um, dialogue between Muslims and Christians to bring justice and peace to our world. There will be dedicated Christians, dedicated Muslims who are working for peace and justice for the community. If this idea grows, and this large community of the family of Abraham works for peace, they can make a big change. And I think it is very, very significant for the future of humanity. Uh, a renewal of Christianity says also the, the meaning of the coming of Jesus. He interprets this as the renewal of Christianity. Christianity will renew itself and will return to the original message of Jesus. He speaks of that as well. Now, Nusi's ideas are not uh, unfamiliar to the Quranic teaching because actually it comes from the Holy Quran. This is a verse in the Quran. Um, say this, Muhammad, O people of the book, the term people of the book is, a, is used for Christians and Jews. All Islamic uh, commentators of the Quran, Islamic scholars, in agreement that the term people of the book is used for Christians and Jews. And that's why uh, the extremist groups, uh, when they use the term infidel, it is not accurate. Absolutely, it's not accurate. Because the Quranic term for Christians and Jews is the people of the book. Um, not infidel. Infidel for those who deny God. Generally, the Quran uses that term for those who deny God. Uh, therefore, here the Quran says, come to a common word, common ground between you and us. And it speaks the most encompassing one. Uh, the, to worship one God. Christians, Muslims, Jews, let's come together and worship one God. That is the most encompassing common ground. But then we can have more things as, you know, having common ground. For example, um, fighting against drug addiction. Let's come together and solve this problem of our community. Let's come together and get rid of poverty in our community. You can uh, find hundreds of these problems that, that is in our communities. And therefore the Quran says, let's come together. Let's come together and get rid of these problems. How we can get rid of it? Well, through togetherness, coming together. And I think that's very important interpretation. Uh, diversity is a divine plan. We may be different, but we still can come together. Our differences should not um, be an obstacle for coming together. It shouldn't be an obstacle. Despite our differences, still, the Quran says, you can come together. It invites people, the Christians, Jews, and Muslims, especially because they have many common ground. It doesn't mean that to exclude the adherence of other traditions. But these three traditions are having big common ground. I would say maybe 85% of things they are in agreement. Uh, here the verse says, if God will, he could have made you one community, but he hasn't made you one community. He, he made you different. And therefore, the Quran says, in, this, in the continuation of this verse, why with one another for good deeds? Why compete with one another for good deeds? This competition is for each other, not against each other. Because you do good deeds, and the person you compete with him or her do good deeds, you bring your good deeds together. So you actually compete for each other, for good things, for good deeds. And that's the Quranic encouragement for uh, you know, humanity. God could have made you one community, but God made you different, uh, different communities is a plan of God. A dialogue in the Quran also, when you are greeted, the Quran says, when you are greeted, respond to an equal or better greeting. As you know, among Muslims, when you say, Assalamu Alaikum, which means, 
That's the greeting of Muslims. Assalamu alaikum. The response to this is wa alaikum salam. That's the exact way to respond. But the Quran says, say more. You see, it says, um, um, better greeting. Equal? That's the equal one. But better greeting, and you see some Muslims will have this, they will say, wa alaikum salam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And peace be with you, and God's mercy be with you, and God's blessings be with you. So he adds two more things uh, to that um, beautiful greeting. And that is the way, you know, when you, that's teaching of the Quran. When somebody uh, uh, does some good things for you, you do some good things and more. More and more. So that that will be increasing the goodness among the members of the community. Uh, again, the Quran encourages Muslims to have good relations with Christians and Jews, the people of the book, as a part of dialogue. Uh, the Quranic understanding of dialogue. Have good relations. In fact, it says, when you have debates, debate, debate in the most beautiful way. Not uh, harming, not insulting, not disrespecting, but you can have your differences and you can debate on your differences in the most beautiful way. Helping each other, even during debates. There is one thing I like to share with you. This is at the beginning of Islam, um, uh, the history of Islam. As you know, Islam started in 609 with the first revelation to the Prophet of Islam. 609 common era. Um, during one of the Prophet's meditation, Angel Gabriel comes to the Prophet. He was meditating in a cave called the Cave of Hira, which is in the suburb of Mecca. Um, and the Prophet uh, was, in fact, uh, the Prophet didn't, didn't expect something like this. Maybe, um, well, he was meditating for 15 years, would go to this, uh, to this cave. Um, the, the voice tells him, read, Iqra. And the prophet says, I cannot read, I am an illiterate. The voice again says, read. And the prophet says, I cannot read, I am an illiterate. The third time the prophet himself narrates the story, he, he says, angel uh, Gabriel, took me and squeezed me to my endurance and said, read in the name of thy Lord who has created, created human beings from a clot of blood. Read, your Lord is the most generous, the most kind, the one who has taught by pen, the one who has taught human beings what they knew not. These were the first verses of the Quran uh, the Prophet says, these verses were engraved on my heart. I couldn't forget it. And he ran out of the cave and he goes home and tells to his wife and says, uh, I'm afraid that I am possessed. I have this experience. His wife, uh, uh, Khadija, uh, who was uh, 15 years his senior, um, said, Muhammad, you are the most righteous person in the community. Uh, you cannot be possessed. Uh, you are the, the trustworthy of this community. Um, God will never uh, allow such a, such a terrible things to you. Let's go to my nephew, uh, Waraka bin Naufal, Waraka, uh, who knew uh, about early sources, you know, Christian sources, Judaic sources, uh, early, early scriptures. And they went to Waraka. And Prophet explained his experience. And Waraka said, Muhammad, this is the same experience that Jesus had. And the same experience that Moses had. It is a good news. You will be the prophet of this community. I wish I survived when they would compel you out of your tongue. I wish I survived that I could help you. 
he passed, he was in his in his nineties. Uh, he passed away, but then later, a, a really uh, a huge reaction, hostile reaction, happened to uh, to the message of the prophet and to his followers. Uh, so, uh, prophet needed to leave his own town, migrate. Uh, revelation came after that occasionally, the Quranic revelation. Later, these will become the Holy Quran. Now, the thing that I like to share with you is the um, migration of a group of Muslims to uh, Abyssinia, uh, modern day Ethiopia. Um, the Prophet realized that his uh, community, members of his communities, uh, are uh, persecuted. So the only way was migration, especially those who were marginals. Uh, and the Prophet said there is a king in Abyssinia. At that time, the name of Ethiopia was Abyssinia. There is a Christian king in Abyssinia. No one is wrong in his land. So I will send my followers to him, and I hope that he will protect uh, Islamic sources suggest that um, 50 male and 20 female uh, Muslims um, migrated to this uh, land, to Ethiopia. Uh, the king uh, received them, questioned them, uh, and asked them about the prophet, and in fact uh, protected them. Uh, there is a very famous story. After listening to, to them, he uh, drew a line on the, uh, on the ground and he says, the difference between you and us is no thicker than this line. That's a remarkable a statement. And the prophet loved, uh, um, his name is um, Najashi. Um, uh, today, even Ethiopian know his name. I asked, uh, actually, several days ago, I was uh, riding a taxi and the driver was from Ethiopia. And I said, what do you call Nejashi? Uh, do you know him? And he said, yes, we know him. He's a great personality in our history. We call him Nejesh. So I learned that today's Ethiopians are called him Nejesh. Uh, in the English tradition, in the English uh, language, generally, it is known as Negus. N-E-G-U-S, Negus. Uh, the prophet loved Najash. In fact, when he passed away, uh, we have some sources that they were uh, corresponding the, with the prophet. He loved the prophet as well. When he passed away, the prophet uh, asked his community to come together and said, today your brother Najashi passed away. Let's have a funeral prayer for him. He preferred funeral prayer in absentia for Najash. It became a tradition in Islam, funeral prayer in absentia, because of this event. Uh, today, it's uh, interesting, to honor uh, the legacy of Najashi in Ethiopia, some Turkish businessmen went to Ethiopia and they established schools called um, Ethio Turkish International Schools. I think about eight of these schools are going on running today in Ethiopia, honoring the legacy of Najashi, naming after Najashi because of this early event in Islam. Um, Muslim Christian dialogue, and that's why I think it's very important. And I think one of the pioneers of dialogue in, in our time uh, is Mr. Fethullah Gulen. Uh, he had a meeting with uh, Pope John Paul II to um, encourage, to promote uh, Muslim uh, Christian dialogue. Um, he has a very beautiful statement, and I like this statement, that's why I choose this. Close the doors of greed, abhorrence, and hatred. They may be a small seed, but by opening the door, they could grow and become a huge tree of evil. So at the beginning, close the door of hatred, uh, uh, as we said earlier. And we have some pictures uh, that he met with um, Pope John Paul II. Uh, this was in 1998 uh, to, to promote a Muslim Christian dialogue, much before 9 11. Um, he also met with uh, several times, several times, met with Bartholomew, uh, the head of the Eastern uh, Orthodox Christianity. 
uh, again to promote Muslim uh, Orthodox uh, Christian uh, dialogue. Uh, he also met with uh, Israel's Sephardic chief rabbi, Eliyahu Bakshi Toron, um, to promote um, Jewish Muslim dialogue as well. Uh, these are some other Muslims, uh, some uh, different groups uh, of, of Muslims who are really in, engaged in dialogue. Uh, this one, uh, I participated in this one. The head of the Islamic Society of North America, uh, scholars from Judaism, from Christianity. Uh, this was called uh, Muslim Baptist Dialogue. Uh, two of them actually uh, from this uh, from, I think, State Department also, because they also come, one of them is working for justice. And this was called Muslim um, Baptist Dialogue. Generally, you don't expect that there will be dialogue between Muslims and Baptists. Um, but it was very interesting. When they had the first annual meeting, uh, they said, perhaps this will be the first one and the last one. But actually, it turned out that they had the second one. Now they are playing the third one. So uh, dialogue uh, became fruitful. Uh, this is a larger uh, dialogue uh, um, meeting, which includes Buddhists and Hindus as well. Uh, this is um, um, Benedict XVI, who visited Blue Mosque in Istanbul. And, and in fact, he caused some uh, damages uh, through his talk uh, in Germany. Uh, but then he went to a mosque and prayed in a mosque and repaired those damages um, after that. And this is final thoughts. I think uh, I like to, and I will finish with this. Um, the last, the last paragraph of my book. Uh, I like to read for you. Let's see if I can do that. It is. Um, it is from the conclusion. Okay. So the current trend of interfaith solidarity is a great step toward a peaceful future for humanity. It can be argued that when the prophet said that Jesus will come as a just ruler, he emphasized the importance of justice and peace on earth. If the trend toward dialogue and cooperation leads to justice and peace in our world, it will mean the fulfillment of the messages of both Muhammad and Jesus. Peace and blessings be upon them. Thank you very much.